Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Rainy Monday Morning, a Chem 1105 with your host, me, Dr. White. All right, I've already sent out the email with the password for test number four, and make sure you take it, upload it as a single PDF file by tomorrow. I think it's 1 p.m. is the deadline. So take test number four, and by the way, be sure to show your work where you need to. And that's test number four. Now, let me remind you today, the 8th, I'm looking at a calendar up there, is the deadline for the extra credit project. One of your colleagues asked, when's the deadline? I'll give you till 11.55 p.m. tonight to hand it in by uploading it to Blackboard. Speaking about Blackboard, let's take a look. If you notice on your screen, you'll see the announcement for the Chem 1105 final exam information, which I posted this morning. Wow, it's almost 6 a.m. That was this morning. All right, a week from today, 5-15-23, I will be giving a comprehensive, that means the whole semester, Chem 1105 final exam online. Just like the test, you'll be given a password. Uh, you'll download a password protected PDF file. And on Monday at around 9 a.m., I will send out a password for the final exam PDF file. And you'll have until Tuesday, 2 p.m., to finish the final exam, upload your final exam answers as a single PDF file. Let me try something new. As a single PDF file, and you'll um, to the assignment area Blackboard. Should, when I've given this type of final face-to-face, -face, most students are done in about 60, 70 minutes. Take up the three hour, yep, I'll be nice three hours to finish the final exam. And as I said earlier, the final exam will cover all material covered in this semester's Chem 1105. I haven't said this in a long time, but my final, just like my hourly exams, every question, the concept behind that question, I've covered at least twice, a lot more actually. Now, the Chem 1105 final has 27 problems, eight pages of questions. Some of the problems are multiple part and they're five multiple choice. The point breakdown, material from test one, 16 points, material from test two, 44 points, material from test three, 29 points, and material from test four, 21 points. And it adds up to 110 points. So there's 10, 10, yes, 10 bonus points. You pick the bonus points. You will need a scientific calculator. I reserve the right to subtract up the 50 points for anybody who doesn't follow the instructions or anybody who does not upload your final exam on time as a single PDF file. Now, I will be posting the final exam scores and listen closely. Also, your Chem 1105 grade by the following Friday probably a little earlier by 1 p.m. at the latest, but I'll try a lot earlier in the week. At that time, I'll post an announcement and send you an email that your final exam score in your Chemi 1105 grade is in Blackboard. Today, tomorrow, and Wednesday, I will do a review of all the material the whole semester. I like that, the whole semester of uh, this week in lecture and lab. And speaking about lab, tomorrow's lab, I need by Saturday, 
tomorrow's lab, instead of giving you normally a week, I need it by Saturday because next week I'm going to be busy grading final exams for this and another class and getting your final grades up and posted. All right. Now, the week of 5 15 23, a week from today, there will be no Zoom lectures or lab. That's because it's final exam week at COD. And if you have any questions, always feel free to email me. Always feel free this week to come to my office hours, which are Tuesday and Wednesday from 6 to 7.15 on Zoom. All right, one thing I didn't say, but I'll remind you later in the week, like all the tests, the final exam underneath will say, please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers, and please use three significant figures for all atomic numbers. All right, what am I gonna do today? We're gonna start doing a review. And let's get going. And that's not the review I want. That's the review I want. Oh, one thing before I forget, which I just did, I would highly recommend that you look at this week when you're studying important information, final exam. The last three pages of the final exam will have this stuff, this stuff meaning stuff you don't have to memorize. Remember I said I cut down memorization a lot. I started doing this a couple of years ago because I decided when another faculty member challenged me, are you testing somebody's knowledge of chemistry or are you testing their memory and knowledge of chemistry? And I realized I was doing the second. I've moved to the first, which is why I give you, you can see right here, important information, final exam. These are all things you don't have to memorize like my students in the past used to, but you still have to know how to use this stuff. And we'll be going through this, a lot of this, today, tomorrow, and Wednesday. All right, let's start the review for the final exam. And test one, which will have 16 points on the final exam, I asked or taught you what are the four branches of chemistry, organic, physical, analytical, and inorganic. By the way, organic is the best. I'm an organic chemist. Now, we talked about matter. Notice I say we, I talked about matter. And that is anything that has mass and occupies space. Now, at this point, I introduce you to the chemical symbols and the periodic table. And I ask you to only learn 37 of them. And what do we mean by learning 37 of them? On test one, I asked you, I don't know if I, what's the chemical symbol for oxygen? Oh, what element has the chemical symbol Na? And that's sodium. Now, I was, I did not ask you to learn every chemical symbol of the periodic table. I don't use them. And there are a few even I don't know because I've never used them. I can look it up, but the ones I do use, I know. And that's the ones I asked you to learn. Now, 
Now, next, we talked about the states of matter. And I asked you to learn them and their definition. And we went through if we were doing this face to face. Now, I say, class, what's the first state of matter? <laughs> they wouldn't do that, but solid. What's the second state of matter? Liquid. What's the third state of matter? Gas. And you should know a solid has definite shape, definite volume. You should know a liquid has indefinite shape, indefinite volume. And finally, you should know a gas has indefinite shape, indefinite volume. Now, there are different types of matter. There's pure substances, and those types can be elements and compounds. And the elements you find in the periodic table. Now, compounds are examples like water is a compound made up of two hydrogens and oxygen. Table salt, sodium chloride, is a compound made up of sodium and chlorine atoms or elements. Both are correct. And then I talked about mixtures. And mixtures are when you combine two different elements or compounds or mixtures of thereof, and neither one changes its chemical identity. And the air you're breathing is a mixture. And there are two types of mixtures, homogeneous, heterogeneous. And homogeneous, the mixture is uniform throughout. It's like in my office, if I walk over to the door, I'm not going to say, oh, there's no oxygen here. It is here, here, anywhere in my house or outside. The oxygen nitrogen level is the same. Now, heterogeneous, that's where it's not uniform throughout the mixture. And I gave you an example like if you took a bottle of water or a glass of water and you dumped in a handful of sand, the sand floats to the bottom and it's different amount at the bottom and there's none at top. I just thought of a new heterogeneous uh, mixture. I'm going to do a generation gap, I think. And they still sell them. And that's marbles. If you took a, a, a beaker of water and put in a handful of marbles, guess what? The marbles would sink to the bottom and it would be a heterogeneous solution. Now, when I was a kid, I was pretty good at marbles. That was when I was in first, second, and third grade, we played them. Here's some cat size. They have any puries here? Puries are like this. We used to call these puries because they were pure, not like cat size. And they're a different size. And we used to play marbles like this with the boulders. Those were the bigger ones. Uh-oh, that's generation gap. I better get back to my review. All right, next we talked about properties of matter, physical property, chemical property. And physical property is something you observe, like what color is that car? It's red or blue. That's a physical property. Also, what's its melting point? What's its boiling point? Now, chemical properties give you the, show you the ability of something to change. An example of a chemical property is water will not burn, but paper will. Do not try that at home. 
and flammability is a chemical property. Now, when we talk about matter, they can undergo two types of changes. And changes in matter, physical change, when it changes its change, state of matter. When ice melts, frozen or solid water, to make a liquid, that's a physical change. When, oh, let's see, when a candle burns, the wax is undergoing a chemical change to make the flame in the wick. And another example of a chemical change is when you eat food, which, by the way, when I was about two or three, you know, a little guy, yes, I was at one time, long time ago, my mother told me, chew your food before you swallow or you'll choke. So I used to wolf it down. I don't know if you know that term. I mean, just shove it in my mouth and eat it real quick. And I found out she was right. I did choke. In case you were wondering, I survived. And when you chew it and it goes in your stomach, the food undergoes a chemical change. Now, next. I talked about temperature and the temperature scales, Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. And I talked about how to convert from one to another using these formulas. And degrees, if you have something in degrees C and you want to convert it to Fahrenheit degrees F, use the first formula, which I showed you. Remember, do the multiplication 1.8 times degree C before you add 32. Next, degree C, you want to convert Fahrenheit degrees F to Celsius degrees C, use the second formula. And here, do what's in the parentheses first, the subtraction before you do the division. I'll say it again. Do what's in the parentheses first, degrees F minus 32, before you divide it by 1.8. Now, at this point, I hadn't taught you, but I now have, so I can say this. Remember, 1.8 is an exact number, and so is 32. Same thing here. Therefore, the only number that determines how many significant figures your answer is, in this one, degree C. In this one, degrees F. Now, in the last one, Calvin equals degree C plus 273. This is an exact number. and I taught you, which we'll go over in a little while, when you add or subtract, I don't think we did any subtraction in this class, you get the same number of significant figures to the right of the decimal as the number you're adding or subtracting that has the fewest significant figures to the right of the decimal. By the way, here's my right hand to the right of the decimal. Decimal, big decimal point. Oh, that was a bad joke, sorry. Now, I talked about scientific notation. Scientific notation is Q times 10 to the N. Q is never less than one or 10 or greater. Know how to convert a number to scientific notation. If the number is greater than 10, then N up here is positive. If the number is less than one, n is negative. And let me have you have some fun.
can, for A and B, convert those to scientific notation. Your turn. And I'll give you a little while to do it. For those who want a long time, if you're watching this video, press or actually click on the pause button. Time's up, or if you need more time, click with your mouse on the pause button of the video. All right, how do you convert A to scientific notation? Well, if there were a decimal point, you move it to the right of the first non-zero number. One, two, three, four, five. Any zeros at the end when there's no decimal are dropped. So that'd be 1.25. That's the two. We moved it one, two, three, four, five times. And this number is greater than 10 and is positive. So it'd be 1.25. Let me fix up that two. It looks awful. One point two five times ten to the fifth. Now here in B we have a number less than one. We move the decimal to the right of the first non-zero number. One, two, three, four, five. Now I don't have here, but if there was a zero at the end after a decimal, you don't drop that, but there isn't any. So this would be 4.32 times 10. How many times do we do? One, two, three, four, oh, five again. But now since it's less than one and is negative, so that would be 4.32 times 10 to the minus fifth. Now next, I talked about determining significant figures. All non-zero numbers are significant. Zeros may or may not be significant. Lead zeros at the beginning of the number are never significant. Confined zeros, be those between non-zero numbers, are significant. Trailing zeros at the end of a number are significant if a decimal point is present or decimal. Trailing zeros at the end of a number are not significant if a decimal the number lacks an explicitly shown de decimal point. And I taught you how to round off. If the first digit to be deleted is four or less, simply drop that and all afterward. If the first digit to be deleted is five or greater, then that digit and all that follow are dropped and the last digit to remain is increased by one. Now, for operation rules, you should know for multiplication division, the number of significant figures in your answer is the same number of significant figures as the number you're multiplying and dividing that has the fewest significant figures. I'll say it again, because a lot of you have been losing points the semester on my test because you haven't followed multiplication division significant figures. When you multiply or divide, you get the same number of significant figures in your answer as the number that has the fewest significant figures in your multiplication or division. I'll say that again. The answer you get in a multiplication division 
has the same number of significant figures as the number you're multiplying or dividing in that multiplication division. For addition, you get the same number of significant figures to the right of the decimal as the number you're adding or subtracting, in my class is adding, that have the fewest significant figures to the right of the decimal. Let's take a quick look, because a lot of you should learn this eventually. Okay, my scientific calculator. And the question is, what's the answer to this using proper significant figures? So let's do it. 3.567 times 4.1111. Now remember, use for scientific notation, make sure your calculator is in scientific notation. Use the second key, then double E. And I have five times 10 to the fifth. Hit equal. My calculator gives me this number. And if you were to put that down in a test for calculation, I take off one point because you didn't use proper significant figures. Now, why don't you round that off to the correct number of proper significant figures? Your turn. And for those who need extra time, we well, can't press, move your mouse, your cursor, and click on the pause button. And when you're done, you can start this video again. All right, let's do this. So you have to figure out how many significance is a multiplication. You get the same number of significant figures in your answer as the number you're multiplying divided that has the fewest. Well, all non-zero numbers are significant. One, two, three, four. Four significant figures. This one has all non-zero numbers. One, two, three, four, five five significant figures. Which one of these is the lowest number? And time's up, hopefully you pick four. So now you have to round this off to four significant figures. How do you do that? Keep the one, keep the four, keep the six, keep the six. That's my four significant figures. The next number I use to round off. Is that four or less or five or greater? And it's four or less, it's four. So I drop that and everything else. And the correct answer to four significant figures is this. You never change this. Now, if that had been a five or greater, the last six would have been increased by one and I'd still drop everything off. Now, next we talked about the periodic table. And the periodic table, you have elements arranged in an increasing atomic number. And you should know the group names. What are the alkali metal, alkaline earth metals, the halogens, 
and the noble gases. And you should know what some of the elements that are metals. Now, the first column, not including hydrogen. The first column, not including hydrogen, are the alkali metals. The second column on the left are the alkaline earth metals. So if I were to ask you, give an example of an alkaline earth metal, and the answer would be magnesium Mg. If I ask, give an example of an element that's an alkali metal and give its name and chemical symbol, well, you could put down, say, lithium Li and a sodium K potassium. You could put the other ones, but I didn't ask you to remember those. All right, next, going all the way over to the right, <clears throat> below the number seven, the elements in that column are the halogens, and those are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. And finally, all the way on the right, the column that has the eight over it on this periodic table, Helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon are all noble gases. Next, we finally got into some chemistry. We talked about the atom. And the atom is the smallest particle of an element that has all the properties of an element. And what are atoms made up? And we did a class participation. If we are face-to-face -face now, I'd say class. Everybody with Dr. White, me. What's the first subatomic particle? And you all yell out, electron. What's the second one? Proton. And what's the third one? Neutron. And you should know an electron has a negative charge. A proton has a positive charge. And a neutron has no charge. Now, we talked about the nucleus of an atom. And you should know, one, that's the center of the atom. Two, you should know, that contains only protons and neutrons. And you should remember that Rutherford's gold foil experiment showed that the nucleus of the atom was very dense and they found out it contained protons and neutrons. Now, when we look at the periodic table, important concept is the atomic number. And the atomic number on the periodic table you'll use for the final exam, this one that you used all semester, is if you look in the upper right-hand corner, that's the atomic number. For lithium, it's three. Sodium, it's 11. Oxygen is eight. Nitrogen, seven. My favorite, carbon, six. And if we look at chlorine, 17. Now, the atomic number, you should know, by definition, equals the number of protons in an element. But, and you should remember this, And you should know this. Oh, I haven't been subtle today yet. All atoms of the elements have a net zero or have a zero charge. Therefore, protons 
are a plus one. Therefore, to get a net a zero charge, the atomic number, which by definition equals the number of protons an element has, also equals the number of electrons, which have a negative one charge. And you should know how many electrons and protons the various elements have. I'll go through this again. Atomic number gives you a number of protons. Atomic number gives you the number of electrons in an element. And if we look at our friendly neighborhood periodic table, how many electrons and protons does carbon have? Well, atomic number is six. It has six electrons, six protons. How many electrons and protons does krypton have? KR, remember in our universe, unless I've been stolen, uh, kidnapped to another universe, krypton is a colorless gas, not a solid, and it won't kill Superman. But krypton has atomic number 36, therefore it has 36 electrons, 36 protons. Next, we talked about if the protons and neutrons are in the electron, are in the neutron, then, let me try, hold on, reboot, no, no, no. If the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, where are the electrons? In the electron clouds around the nucleus. And they are in shells and subshells. And the shells are named one, two, three, and four. And you'll be given this table and the one below it and important information, test number, I mean, final exam. And you should know the highest, lowest energy shell is one. When you go down the table, the energy increases to four, which is the highest on that. Now, this table also gives you the number of subshells. Shell one has one, two has two, and so on. Next, for the subshells, S, P, D, and F, S is the lowest, and so on. Now, I should really have here max number of electrons. Shell S, you can only put two electrons, P, 6, D, 10, F, 14. Now, I asked you to learn how to do the electron configuration. And that's a statement that shows how many electrons an atom has in each of its subshells. Remember, a subshell is identified by a number and a letter. I'll say that again in slow motion. A subshell is identified by a number and a letter, not just a number or not just a letter. And for electron configuration, we use number and letters only to figure out the electron configuration. Now, remember my secret, my secret gift to you, you only have to know how to do electron configurations up to magnesium 12. All right, let's do, I don't know, carbon. Now, carbon, has six atomic number six, so it has 
six electrons. Again, we're doing the electron configuration. Now, the first shell is one, has only one subshell, S. And if you look at the table, you can only put two electrons in it. Now, I've filled all the subshells in one. It's only got one, one S. So now I go to subshell or shell two, and the first subshell, lowest energy, is again S, now two S. Remember, a subshell, number, and a letter. How many electrons can I put into 2s? Well, any s subshell, you can only put two electrons. Well, two plus two is four. Six minus four means I have two electrons left to go. Now, shell two has two subshells. The first one is 2s. The second one is 2p. And now I can put up to six electrons in any p orbital, but I only need two, and that's how you do that. 1s2, 2s2, 2p2, six electrons counted for. Yay! And finally, we talk, notice I say we, I talked about valence electrons. You should know. Valence electrons are the outermost electrons of an element. How do you determine the valence electrons? You look at the top of the periodic table, and that tells you how many valence electrons for that column or family. And the maximum number of valence electrons is eight. If we look at the periodic table, how many valence electrons does hydrogen have? One. How many is sodium? Same column. One. We look at how many valence electrons does oxygen have? And we look over here, O, look above, six. And how many does sulfur have? Same thing, six. And if we look at how many valence electrons chlorine has, look at the top, seven. And finally, oh, my favorite, because I used a lot in grad school, argon. How many valence electrons does a noble gas argon have? Eight. And that's everything for test number one. If I look at the clock, this would be a good time for us to take a five-minute break. I'm going to get up and stretch, and I'll see you in five minutes. And we'll continue with our review for the final exam.
let's get going. Looked out my weather window and it's raining, which my lawn can use. All right. That was test number one review. Let me just close something. All right, let's look at test number two review. If you look at the points, and let's do that right now. Material from test two, which is the most important, has 44 points out of 110. So let's go through that material, some of it, and I'll do more tomorrow. All right, we talked about Lewis structures. Lewis structure, how do you do the Lewis structure for an element? You take the element symbol and one dot per valence electron and one dot on each side before doubling up. So if I were to ask, draw the Lewis structure for oxygen, Oxygen has six valence electrons, not the atomic number. This is valence electrons. So you have the chemical symbol, one, two, three, four, and then two more sides have another dot. The organic chemists, which I am, do it this way. You could have just as easily done it this way, which I wouldn't, but I did for you. All right. That's how you do a Lewis structure of an element. Next, I talked about the forces that hold atoms together and molecules, and those are the chemical bonds. And there are two types you should know. Ionic bond, that results from the transfer of one or more electrons from one atom or group of atom to another atom or group of atom. Covalent bond, that results from sharing Pairs, one or more pairs of electrons. Remember, pair means two. Two. And you should know this. Now, I didn't ask you to learn, but it was important. The octet rule in compound or molecule formation, atoms of elements lose, gain, or share electrons in such a way that their electron configuration becomes identical to that of the nearest noble gas in the periodic table, which is eight valence electrons. Now, when an atom loses electrons, it forms a positive ion called a cation. When an atom gains electrons, it forms a negative ion called an anion. Now, Elements lose or gain electrons as have the same number of electrons. Ooh, I, know I spelled that wrong. Electronians. I've came up with a new word. I better patent it. No, can't patent things, copyright it. But anyways, same number of electrons as the nearest noble gas. And elements never lose protons forming an ion. And go back and look at the video when I did this, but let's do one. If you look at test number two, I had a number of these. What ion does calcium form? Well, calcium has this chemical symbol, and we have to look at the periodic table. If we look at calcium, we'll notice it has 20 electrons, 20 protons. Now, what's the nearest noble gas numerically based on atomic number? Well, krypton is 36 at 16 away. Argon at 18 
is only two away. What's the smaller number? And eh, time's up. Hopefully you pick two. So how do you figure what ion, and it would be show the ion that calcium forms? Well, it's that 20 electrons, 20 protons. It wants to go to the same number of electrons, 18, as the nearest noble gas argon. But the number of protons never changes. Now, each electron is a minus one. Each proton, oops, I wrong number. Is has a positive one plus one charge. Do the math, minus 18 plus 20, add them together, and you get a plus two. Now, I, what ion? You show that by a chemical symbol and superscript the charge. Now, this is the old way, new way, which Dr. White doesn't like, but you can use. And either one of these would be the correct answer. What ion would calcium form? By the way, if you know you're supposed to have calcium for strong bones, which is so you don't get things when you get old, which I don't have, thank goodness, osteoporosis, because I get enough calcium. It's not the metal, it's the ion that you need. And you take that in supplements or your milk or other dairy products or things that are fortified with calcium. Now, when writing an ionic formula, remember all molecules have a net zero charge. And if I ask you to write the ionic formula for calcium plus two, chloride plus minus one, this is a plus two, but this is a minus one. It has to add up to zero. Therefore, you need two, calcium, yeah, two chloride ions. That's a minus one. You can't see it. And therefore, you write it this way. Now, at this point, I had talked about uh, polyatomic ions, which I forgot to mention. The nitrate is one. Write the ionic formula for the molecule made up of calcium plus two cations and nitrate minus one anions. Your turn. And if you need more time, click on pause, because I'm going to go ahead. This is a plus two. This is a minus one. It has to add up to zero. It doesn't. So I need two of those. And how do I show that for a polyatomic ion? When you have more than one, you put it in a bracket, write the ion, close bracket and subscript. How many? Two, if it's only one, you don't use the brackets. Now, next I talked about covalent bonds. And there are three types that you should know, which I asked on test number two. Write down the name and how many pairs of electrons being shared for two of the three type of covalent bonds. And they are the single bond, which has one pair of electrons. Double bond, two pair of electrons being shared, and a triple bond, three pair of electrons being shared. And you should know, single bond, one pair of electrons being shared. Double bond, two pairs of electrons being shared. Single bond, one pair of electrons. Double bond, two pair, triple bond. 
free pair of electrons being shared. Now I asked you to learn how to draw the Lewis structure of molecules. And there all molecule uh, atoms should have an octet. And if I asked you draw the Lewis structure for nitrogen, gas, N2, this deals with valence electrons. Nitrogen has five valence electrons. I've got two nitrogen, each one. Has five valence electrons. And this nitrogen says to that one, hey, I've got three unpaired electrons. You do, let's share. And they do. And the non-bonding electrons are still there. Now, how many pairs are there? Three pairs. And that's a triple bond. Now, if you have a molecule with alkali metals or alkaline earth metals, those will always be ions, cations. So if I ask you to draw the Lewis structure for sodium hydroxide, NaOH, sodium has how many? One valence electron, oxygen, six valence electrons, and hydrogen, one valence electron. How do you do that? You look at the periodic table. Now, sodium will always form an ion, and you learned that's a plus one ion. Oxygen has six valence electrons, hydrogen one, so they share. But if you notice, oxygen does not have an octet. It only has seven valence electrons. How does it get an octet? Well, where did this valence electron go? It left sodium and goes over here. And now oxygen has this octet, but it has uh, extra electron and the hydroxide ion is formed, OH minus. And between sodium and A plus and the hydroxide ion, OH minus, there's an ionic bond. Between the oxygen and hydrogen in the hydroxide of sodium hydroxide, there's a covalent single bond. Now, next we talked about chemical equations, and that would be A plus B makes C. And A and B, you should know, are the reactants also called the starting materials. C is the product. Now, in a chemical equation, due to the conservation of mass law, you have the same number of elements and the same type on either side of the arrow. And if they don't, you have to balance that. How do you balance that? by changing the coefficients. Now, I showed you some rules and or tricks, I like to call them. And that is, first of all, my advice, when you're balancing chemical equations, leave oxygen and hydrogen last. And remember the even odd trick. Now, let's go and look at a chemical equation. Take sodium metal reactor with chlorine gas, you'll make sodium chloride. It's quite, look, go on YouTube, you'll see it. It's really exothermic and it gives off a lot of energy. It's amazing to see. Don't try this ever at home. Now, 
Notice I have two quarry on this side. Uh-oh, I don't hear. Well, you can't change the number here, students. Try and put it to there. No, -uh, that's something. But you can change the coefficient. The coefficient is the number in front. When there's no number, it's one. So if I have two chlorine here, I need two chlorine here. How do I do that? Put a two there. Well, now I have two sodium here, but only one. How do I get two sodium? I do that. And now check two sodium, two sodium, two chlorine, two chlorine. And I'm going to let you have some fun. Why don't you balance the following chemical equation? Three points each. By the way, on the final exam, I think I have two or three. I can't remember which right now. I think it's one of those two where you have to balance chemical equations. So this is a skill you should have for the final exam. Your turn. Balance that equation. Remember, leave hydrogen, oxygen last. Good advice. By the way, C7H16 is an organic compound called heptane. All right, if you need more time, click on the pause button. And when you're done, play, click on play again for this video. All right, well, let's look at this. I'm going to follow my advice and leave hydrogen and oxygen for last. So I have seven carbon on this side. Oh, I only have one. How do I get seven? You can't change how many in a molecule, but you can change the coefficient. So now I have seven carbon. Well, next, I'm going to do hydrogen. Here I have 16 hydrogen. Here I only have two, but I need 16. How do I do that? Well, I can't change that H2 to H16. That doesn't exist. But I can change the coefficient. Two times eight is 16. So now I have 16 hydrogen. And finally, we have oxygen two here. But on this side, you count all the oxygen atoms. Seven times two is 14 oxygen. Eight times one is eight oxygen. Add them together. And this is going to be hard. You get 22 oxygen. Well, here I have. Uh, two, let me give myself a little more room here. How do I get 22? Well, 11 times 2 is 22. And now I'll check. 7 carbon, 7 carbon. 16 hydrogen, 16 hydrogen. 22 oxygen. 22 oxygen, yay, yeah, it's balanced. And that's how you do it. And I'll let you look up the even odd trick from the practice problems for this chapter. Now, next, I talked about probably one of the most important concepts to me, Dr. White, in 
general chemistry, and that's the mole. And the mole isn't a furry little animal that, oh, hold on one second, I've never done this before. Well, that didn't work out. And there we are. We talk about a mole. We're not talking about a furry little animal that digs holes in the ground. We're talking about, I don't think I'll ever do this again, the chemist county unit. And you should know that the chemist county unit, one mole of an element is one mole of an element is Avogadro's number. You should know Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. You should know one mole of a compound is Avogadro's number, 6.02 molecules of that compound. If we look at the following, how many molecules are in 6.22 moles of HCl? And here I start teaching you your good buddy, your good friend, unit analysis. And what are we being asked to find? Molecules of HCl. What are we given? Moles of HCl. We start with this. We then have here, and I'm going to move to the whiteboard for this. Oh, I got this wrong. Hold on. All right, now the first thing I taught you when you have a word problem, relax, you learn how to do word problems, is what are you being tried, asked to find? And the answer is molecules of hydrochloric acid, HCl. What are you given? 6.22 moles of HCl. The only number I have to start with is this. If there was some ratio, I could convert this to my answer. What do I want my answer to be in unit-wise? Molecules. And now it's time to use my good buddy, my good friend, unit analysis. And hopefully this semester, it's been your good buddy, your good friend too. And how do you use that? Whatever you're trying to get to, the units go on top of this ratio. Whatever you're trying to get rid of, the units go underneath that ratio.
And where do I get these numbers? I taught you that if you have one thing equals something else, then you have two ratios, A over B, and not equal, two separate ratios, B over A. And if you look at important information, final exam, you'll see one mole of a compound equals Avogadro's number of molecules that compound, Avogadro's number 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So if I go back, I have one mole of a compound equals Avogadro's number. And now, before I pick up my calculator, I know this is three significant figures. Avogadro's number is a calculated, not a, and not an exact number. It's also for this class, three significant figures. And the one is an exact number. If I do the math, and let's go back to the problem set. You'll see the answer when rounded off, the three significant figures is that number. And if we look at a similar problem for how many moles are 8.22 times 10 to 17 molecules of oxygen gas, O2. We're trying to find moles of O2. We're given this number, how many molecules. This is the only number we have to start with. I'm trying to get the moles of O2. If I have that ratio, using your good buddy, your good friend, your analysis, the moles go on top of the ratio. The molecules, which I want to get rid of, remember anything divided by itself is number one, on. And that goes underneath. And one mole of a mole of a compound of a Gajo's number. And this is four, three. I round it off to three. Now, next thing we talked about is molecular weight. What's molecular weight? The molecular weight of a compound is the sum of all atomic weights. The molecular weight of a compound is the sum of all atomic weights. And on test two and three, four, and the final, it will say, please use three significant figures for all atomic weights. And where do you find the atomic weights of an element? You look underneath the symbol in the periodic table. Hydrogen, 1.008. Carbon, all the way over here, 12.011. Now, as I just said, well, first thing, I have some water because it's thirsty work. is thirsty work. Use all atomic masses to three significant figures. We look at carbon at 12.011. Round that off to three significant figures. Your turn. Time's up. Keep the one, keep the 12, keep the zero. Three significant figures. Use the next number one to round off. Is that four or less? Yes. So I dropped those two ones for carbon to three significant figures. It will be 12.0. Why don't you round off the three significant figures? Oxygen. And on the periodic table, it's 15.999. 
All right, how do you round this off to three significant figures? Keep the five, one, keep the five, keep the nine. That's my three significant figures. Use this to round off. Is that four or less or five or higher? And eh, hopefully pick five or higher. I'm going to drop this and this and increase that by one, which gives me 1.0 plus 15 is 16.0. So for oxygen, that's 16.0. Now, the molecular weight of a compound is the sum of all atomic weights in that compound. So what is the molecular weight Water, H2O. Hopefully by now you all know water is H2O. Well, you have to do the sum of all atomic weights as two hydrogen. Remember, I didn't mention it, but in test one, you learned how to tell how many atoms are in a molecule. And this has one oxygen. And each hydrogen has an atomic weight of 1.01 .01 to three significant figures. Each oxygen, as we just saw, 16.0. Do the math. Now add this up. This is H. Let's try this again. This is 18.02. Now, when you do addition, you have the same number of significant figures to the right of the decimal as the number with the fewest significant figures to the right of the decimal. This has two, this has one to the right of the decimal. Your answer when you do an addition, which is what I'm doing here, has the same number of significant figures to the right of the decimal as the number that has the fewest, which in this case is one. So you keep the zero, use the two to round off, and that's four or less. So the correct answer for the molecular weight of water is 18.0. And for this class, that's also in grams. And here I have different things you should know how to do. And the next thing I talked about was one mole of an element equals the atomic weight in grams of that element. And one mole of a compound equals the molecular weight of that compound in grams. So what does that mean? It means, if we look at <clears throat> number seven, how many moles are 45.33 grams of sodium chloride? What are we being asked to find? Moles of sodium chloride, NaCl. What are we given? Grams of sodium chloride. And how do we proceed? Well, right here, we have the grams of sodium chloride. We're trying to get the moles of sodium chloride. So it's time to use your good buddy, your good friend, unit analysis. Whatever we're trying to get to goes on top of the ratio. Whatever we're trying to get rid of goes underneath. Now, when you do that, you won't have the numbers 1 and 58.5 in there. Where do you find that? Note. And it's also important information, final exam. One, comp, one mole of a compound equals the molecular weight of the compound. And so we just found out the molecular weight 
is the sum of all atomic weights. And here, the molecular weight, and I use the abbreviation MW for sodium chloride, one sodium atomic weight is 23.0 to three significant figures. One chlorine is 35.5 to three significant figures. And you add it up, and those, both of these have one number to the right, one significant figure to the right of the decimal. So that's the molecular weight of sodium chloride is 58.5. And therefore, one mole sodium chloride is 58.5. Now, I didn't do earlier, but notice grams of sodium chloride divided by grams of sodium chloride become the number one, because anything divided by itself is number one. Those units are gone, and we're left with moles of sodium chloride. Now, 45.33, four significant figures, one mole, exact number. <laughs> I don't know how I do it with my hand. But anyways, I can't write on a PDF file, at least I haven't figured it out. If you know how, let me know. And finally, 58.5, three significant figures. You get the same number of significant figures in your, not the right, same, that's addition, this is a multiplication. You get the same number of significant figures in your answer as the number you're multiplying and dividing. There's a few of significant figures. Exact numbers play no role. Four, three, no role, three significant figures. Now let's do a different one, number nine. How many grams are 5.12 moles of water? And you should know water is H2O. We're trying to find grams of water. We're given moles of water. We have the moles of water. We have some ratio that we would want to use to get to our final answer what would be the units of the final answer? Well, we figure it out here, grams of water. And now it's time to use your good buddy, your good friend, unit analysis. Whatever you're trying to get to goes on top of the ratio, the units. Whatever we're trying to get rid of goes underneath. Where do we get that? And let me go to the actual important information to show you. One mole of a compound equals the molecular weight of that compound. And the molecular weight of that compound is the sum of all atomic weights. Therefore, for number nine, we need the molecular weight of water because one mole equals the molecular weight of water. One goes here, where it was grams of water, we need the molecular weight. As we just did, water has two hydrogens, one oxygen, and it's 18.0. And if we notice moles of water divided by moles of water cancel out, and we now have three significant grams of water, which is our final answer, three significant figures, three, one, and you get 93.8. You could have also on your calculator written it down 9.38 times 10 to the one. And that's how you do it. Now, if I look at the clock, I think this will be a good time to wind down. Well, I've never used that before, wind down. <laughs> I guess you go backwards to wind it down the lecture, and let me remind you, today by right before midnight, you should, if you want to, and it's optional, upload your extra credit project to Blackboard. Also, I've already sent out the password for test number four, and you should be working on that. You have until tomorrow, 1 p.m., to upload it to Blackboard. Tomorrow, we will be doing the final lab, and that will be due Saturday. And finally, 
what was I going to say finally? Well, finally, ooh, I almost forgot, and I'll put it out in an email. This Wednesday, if people show up to the um, live Zoom meeting, I will take you, shh, don't tell anybody, on a tour of a chemical plant, and you'll get to see the inside of a chemical plant that nobody usually gets to see unless you work for one. Shh, don't tell anybody. But I will cut it out of the video, and I will not post it. So this Wednesday, be sure to come for that special surprise or fun thing. You'll get a tour of a, inside of a chemical plant. You'll get to see me with my hair dark. And with that, I'll say, don't forget to do test number four today. It's due by tomorrow. And I'll say, gang goodbye. I stole that from Granny to Beverly Hillbillies.